Diego. Today I want to make sure you know that we have a media free zone. We are uh, recording this event, so if you do not want to participate in that, please have a seat over in this area there. We'll make sure you are not on camera or not photographed. And welcome everybody. There's 60 plus of you today. So glad we're going with the uh, quality group that we have here today. Love to have you. We're going to start right in with a song with our own very own musical maestro, Paul Spenson. Jailhouse Rock by a man called Elvis Presley. Take it away, Paul. Okay. So the first thing you need to do is you need to say the following words. This is an Elvis song, everybody up, please. You need to say, Mama, baby, mama. Ready? Ready? One, two, three. Mama, baby, mama. That's good, huh? Okay, so the words to this song, this is Jailhouse Rock. Read the words carefully as you sing them. You'll enjoy the hidden meaning. Sunday afternoon, I'll tell you that. 
Um, we had the sexual health uh, workshop that was in the North County. Um, I attended that with many of the other assemblers and some other people that was on meetup. And it's, I want to say, it's growing bigger every month, but that doesn't seem like right to say. I think there are people attending every month. Um, we had the family dinner last night that was at Coop's um, down there in uh, Levy Grove, I believe it was, and uh, many of the assemblers attended. We have family dinner every night. That's on meetup if you care to join us. It's, uh, it's, when we say family dinner, it's this family, if you have this group of people, please come on down and it's just, uh, we don't really talk shop, we just uh, enjoy each other's company. Um, the, some of the organizers went up in conjunction with the LA Assembly and uh, we did diversity training, um, which we're very proud of. Um, and we had our board meeting, um, which was, uh, uh, we do actually have a board and uh, bylaws and we're a 501c3 and we, uh, we have some very dedicated people who meet uh, late into the night to make sure that we're doing what you want to do for Sunday assembly. So we appreciate your input and we always be discussing in those meetings. And the biggest thing that's happened here in uh, Sunday assembly, we're really proud of this. There's over 70 assemblies in the whole world. They're in New Zealand, they're in Amsterdam, and they're in the uh, United Kingdom. There's a bunch of them here in the United States. Right. Half of them in Detroit. Right. Right. Assembly, uh, I think every two weeks in Conway Hall. We've been one, so it's fantastic. Uh, there's there's five assemblies that are accredited now. There are five assemblies that are got the bona fides, and uh, the San Diego Sunday Assembly is the third accredited assembly in history. Sunday Assembly. Two of the biggest ones. Did you cue that up, David? No. Um, we're going to go, so at this point, I want to make sure you know that we do have a uh, kids zone. Um, the kids from the age of one and a half up, um, we can watch in there. They're having a program today. They're making uh, bird feeders, and then uh, uh, Nick is going to lead the program for the day. Um, but if you have any children, this would be a great time for them to head out and join us there. Uh, we'd love to have the children and the families attend. And uh, thank you very much for bringing your entire family to Sunday Assembly San Diego. Today we're going to start with reading. Well, Amy Lemmy is going to be our reader today. She's reading Ladies from the Letters from My Grandnephew by Christopher Myers. Amy, will you come on up? So this is a letter to my grandnephew, for which Christopher Myers was awarded third place uh, in the memoir category of the 2013 Prison Writing Contest. July 28. are starting. The dictator of North Korea got married. Albania has never won an Olympic medal. I've made a pair of plastic balls out of compressed plastic wrap. I only have three ballpoint pens left. I ate a big hot dog today with mustard and onions on it. There was an extra bun and I ate that with just sauerkraut. I don't like the color blue. I wrote a poem about a little girl who drowned in a river. I like the rifleman. There's a turkey sandwich and a paper sack at the foot of my bed. And I just saw the flag of Bosnia and Herzegovina for the first time in my life. I have a little yellow plastic bead that's shaped like an elephant. It's standing on a small red hexagonal box that sits on top of my TV set. The box is painted with glittery paint and has a picture of the Buddha on it. And inside the box is the 1,000th paper which you need to come visit me. My TV set has a 13-inch screen and a transparent case so you can see all the wires and components and electrical stuff inside. And it has a real cathode, too. I'll bet none of your TV sets do. <laughs> I'd wear a kilt if I had one. I have an Arabic language CD, but no CD player. When I was six years old, I wore thick eyeglasses. I wish my sister Alyssa didn't have cancer. Today, when I was working on my math, I had trouble holding my left hand steady. Last Monday, I taught a yoga class. The paper I write letters to you on is eight inches by 10 and a half inches. I hate that. It's supposed to be eight and a half by 11. 
I'm writing a computer program to solve systems of nonlinear equations, but since I don't have a computer, I'm writing it in my head. You are almost six years old. All the Czech Republic athletes are wearing blue boots. My brother Bob used to live in the Czech Republic. I get very nervous sometimes. I don't believe that our eternal destiny is determined by what we do in this lifetime. The greatest clarinet player of all time was Henry Cuesta. I have written 721 pages of letters to you. It's possible to chew a piece of celery forever because the cellulose in it doesn't break down. A British guy won the Tour de France this year. My beard is long and the hair on my head is thin and I look in the mirror more than I used to. My favorite TV show is Kate Boss. I own two rubber bands. Oh no wait, it's three. I just remembered. I have a rubber band around a bundle of 26 artificial, artificial sweetener packets. I visited Idaho once and I saw the state capitol building. My watch battery went dead, so now I sometimes carry a digital clock in my pocket. The Indians are in third place. I heard that lightning starts on the earth and strikes upward toward the sky. I like the trumpet solo in Penny Lane. And dogs are cool, I decided. Unless my sister accidentally wrote the same name twice, I recently had two grandnephews who are both named Carson. The world is, an ex is astonishingly beautiful, and happiness is easy. I love you.
but she can still feel the lump and she feels it growing. She submits another request. The same thing happens. Weeks and months go by. She submits more requests. Eventually she is seen again. And this time the nurse feels the lump. The woman feels some hope. She's referred for a mammogram. She goes back to her cell. She waits and waits and waits. Nothing happens. She submits another request and another. Eventually she's seen again. The nurse apologizes for the delay and says, should we submit the referral? By now a year has passed. By the time she's diagnosed, the cancer has progressed to stage three, and she has to have a mastectomy and chemotherapy. If she had been seen promptly when she was incarcerated, those things would have been avoidable. <clears throat> now imagine a less sympathetic prisoner, a killer, a drug gang thug, who even uh, killed another prisoner while in prison for murder himself. <clears throat> Why should I? Uh, cancer isn't contagious. Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this drug gang thug is put in a cell with a toilet that overflows. He's forced to eat his meals stench of raw sewage permeating the air every day for two years. So cancer isn't contagious and the thug is never getting out, so why should I care? These prisoners pose no threat to me personally. Two reasons. First, the punishment should fit the crime, and second, anyone can go to prison for good cause or not. Most people agree that the punishment should fit the crime because the point of criminal laws is a deterrent uh, to deter people from committing specific acts. If punishment is arbitrary, there's no deterrent from committing more serious crimes. Also, a fundamental sense of fairness dictates that a small crime deserves a light punishment and a hard, uh, serious crime deserves a harsh punishment. Should he wallow in human waste for two years for what he did? Maybe. <coughs> Should she lose her breasts for writing bad checks? Maybe. But if we decide that they should, then we need to know why we're doing it and what we hope to gain as a society. Because otherwise, if we don't, then we're denying the humanity of an entire group of people. And when that happens, you get the results like Walter Scott being killed for a traffic stop, or a woman losing her breasts for writing bad checks. The Eighth Amendment of the Constitution was written with exactly this in mind. It says, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. For prisoners, the key words are cruel and unusual, and the most important word in that phrase is and, because courts have interpreted this to mean that no matter how cruel the punishment may seem, if it is not also unusual, it is not unconstitutional. Now I want this to sink in for a minute, because what this means is that we as a society dictate what punishments are, are acceptable uh, by allowing them to become commonplace. For example, the United Nations has guidelines for the treatment of prisoners, and they have, uh, <coughs> their guidelines say that uh, a prisoner should not be held in solitary confinement for more than 60 days. In Arizona, the average stay is five years in solitary confinement. We in Arizona have said that that's okay with us by letting it happen. Uh, therefore, if you don't care what happens to prisoners, you're allowing the standard for how we punish people to be decided by the guards, the wardens, and the politicians who benefit from the harshest possible punishments to support a law and order agenda. <clears throat> That's like letting your toddler decide what constitutes a good meal. <laughs> you know it's gonna be a disaster. <laughs> the next most compelling reason you should care is that incarceration is now mostly a private, for-profit business, and that means that cops are just prison bed salesmen with a compelling sales pitch and a high motivation to get new customers. But I don't write the law, you're thinking. Let me explain how each and every one of you could find yourselves in jail or prison. The first scenario is the corrupt law enforcement. If a cop wants to arrest you, 
they can find a way. There's always the crime of fits the description. That means that you look like someone the cop wants to arrest. It's entirely subjective, but it provides the probable cause necessary to arrest you and put you in jail. Have you ever changed lanes in traffic without using your turn signal? <laughs> That's enough for a cop to pull you over and investigate. Now, during this investigation, police are free to say that they smelled alcohol or marijuana, whether they did or not. There's no way to prove it, and juries generally believe what's written in a police report or what the cop says on the stand. <clears throat> so maybe you think that tampering with evidence is let me read you some of last week's headlines from Wednesday's news. The Justice Department and FBI have formally acknowledged that nearly every examiner in an elite FBI forensic unit gave flawed testimony in almost all trials in which they offered evidence against criminal defendants over more than a two-decade period before 2000. These cases included 32 defendants sentenced to death. In Massachusetts, chemist Annie Dugan's malpractice led to more than 500 people being released from prison. In Detroit, police shut down their crime laboratory after an audit uncovered serious errors in numerous cases. The audit said sloppy work had probably resulted in wrongful convictions. Auditors re-examined 200 randomly selected shooting cases and found serious errors in 19. <coughs> In North Carolina, agents withheld exculpatory evidence or distorted evidence in more than 230 cases over a 16-year period. Three of those cases resulted in execution. So that's the first scenario. Second scenario, down on your luck. Imagine that you have a financial crisis that's no fault of your own, but your savings are wiped out. You have to move into a cheaper apartment, get a second job, you have to scrape by to pay your bills. You're barely keeping it together. Then you get a crack in your windshield. And your insurance won't pay to fix it. You get an estimate, but you can't afford it. So you decide to uh, put that off. I can still drive, I think, I can still see. But you put it off until after you made some more progress on the crisis. Then on the way to your second job one day, you get pulled over and you get a ticket for the cracked windshield. The fine is $350. You don't have the money. You're so busy, you forget about it. You don't show up for your court date. A warrant is issued for your arrest. The next time you're pulled over, you're arrested, put in jail, and your car is impounded. When you get out, you have to pay $150 to get the car back, but the crack is still there. The next time you get pulled over, it's a week in jail. And then this time, you get out and you've lost your jobs. That's the second scenario. The third scenario, mental illness. Anyone can become mentally ill. For example, Alzheimer's is usually reserved for the elderly, but it can strike relatively young. It's usually marked by a change in behavior, such as loss of self-control, the inability to understand the consequences of action. Criminal laws are designed to prevent exactly these behaviors. And if you're not diagnosed, or even if you are, your behaviors are likely to be interpreted as criminal before a mental health uh, diagnosis is considered. Uh, and even something as nonviolent as public nudity can end, end up with years in prison, depending on the circumstances. <clears throat> so that's three ways any one of us might end up in jail or prison. When you combine the profit motive with laws that give law enforcement enormous latitude, it begins to explain why the U.S. is nearly 2% of its population in jail or prison and rising. Now, 2% may not seem like a lot, but when you consider that all of those people have family and friends, a lot of people are affected. Now, what I'd like to do now, if you feel comfortable, is uh, to ask you to raise your hand if you can say any one of the following. And I want you to wait until I'm done to raise your hands. If you can say that you know someone who has a friend or family in prison, if you know someone who's been in jail or prison, or if you yourself have been in jail or prison, raise your hand. Have a look around. cancer is a composite of several different cases that I've had, but the theme is universal, uh, neglecting serious health care concerns. 
But the drug gang that I, it's a real person. His name is Jim Skinner, and he's my best friend. He's been in prison for over 20 years, most of it in solitary confinement. He was one of my first prisoner clients. Uh, and in the time that he's been in prison, he's earned his GED, taught himself nine languages, 10 if you include legalese. <laughs> he taught himself civil litigation. When he first became my client, he knew more about prisoner civil rights litigation than I did. I still consult with him about my cases. In fact, he called this morning, gave me some great advice on the case. Uh, he's never given me bad advice. Yes, he did very bad things years ago. But he is more intelligent, trustworthy, and law-abiding than many lawyers I know. <laughs> he won his first lawsuit for cleaning supplies. If conditions did not change, so he filed another one. That case is still going on. The Assistant Attorney General, in that case, the opposing counsel, has lied to the court. He continually brings up Jim's past, and he even lied to the court about, uh, to make it sound worse than it actually was. All of this to argue that Jim doesn't deserve to live in sanitary conditions. Almost everyone in prison has someone who cares about them, regardless of their crimes. Once you know that prisoners are people, people with family, people with friends, people with the capacity to love, people who suffer when they're hurt, it becomes difficult to condone harsh and arbitrary punishments. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, every week at Sunday Assembly, we have a section we call, uh, it's a personal story, uh, doing their best. Uh, it's about a story that uh, some are doing their best. And so uh, we ask that to be one of you next time. Uh, somebody who has a story that they want to share. Um, we've had a bunch of organizers and some, some of the assemblers, but we'd like, uh, you have a story. Each of you has a story. We'd like to hear it. So please, if you're interested in doing that, uh, see one of the organizers. We're all in the back after the assembly. Um, we'd love to hear your personal story. We'd love to schedule it uh, around your schedule. Um, we have the dates for calendars of all the assemblies. Today, we're going to hear from Stephanie Hamovich, who is going to tell us her personal story, doing her best. Not because it's hard for me to empathize with people, 
because it's sometimes hard for me to decide who to empathize with. I've always been good at putting myself in someone else's shoes, everyone with my own families. These people directly had an effect on my life and how they dare they screw it up. My upbringing was a difficult one, one filled with both physical and verbal abuse. As a child, it started off with being hit with a bell or getting spanked on the rear end, not too unusual for an Italian household. But as I got into my teenage years, it turned into a whole different story. My sisters and I were punched and thrown across rooms as and sent up the steps by my father. My mother tried to choke and shoot us or throw knives at us during her very typical fits of blind rage. She would try to slash my tires if I came home past midnight up until I was 26 years old. I was told by my very own mother that she wished I would have died at birth, that I was stupid, and pretty much every possible horrible thing you could ever tell a daughter. I would often come home to my entire bedroom's contents emptied onto the garage floor, and I'd spend hours putting it all back together. You must be thinking at this point that I must have been quite a pill to have warranted this type of parenting style. On the contrary, my violations, having too many American friends, wanting to move out of my parents' home before I'd be married off to a nice Italian boy, wearing spaghetti strap shirts, coming home at 12.30 a.m. at 26 years old, getting calls on the phone by boys in high school and trying to date like a normal young woman in college. Why was I given this family? Why did I have to grow up with parents who never said I love you like my friends' parents? Why did I have to endure physical and verbal abuse while all of my friends got nothing but hugs and encouraging and supportive words from theirs? Why do I have to go through hell just to be a normal young woman? I, don't, I, don't, I was a horrible Italian daughter and an awful being American. As I entered my mid to late 20s, I started to become a bitter and angry woman. My self-esteem was shot. I had no clue who I was and no clue who I was supposed to be. I was 26 when I finally decided I didn't want to be guilted into living like this anymore. I packed up all of my belongings into my car in the middle of the night and left. The seven years since that night has been quite a life-altering time for me. I was lucky enough to meet some pretty amazing people in my life who helped me through this time and helped me realize who I was and what I deserved. My husband, Neil, was one of those people, and he continues to be keeping me grounded and motivated to be the best person I can be, and I'm thankful to have him by my side. It was during this time that I started to look at my family through a different lens. I started focusing more on their story rather than my own. Both of my parents were born and raised in the Italian countryside. My dad was a farmer in Italy during World War II. Much of his childhood was spent hiding out in caves on the hillside and hoping a bomb didn't drop on him, his parents, or any of his seven siblings. When the war was over, he plowed the fields with his family from sunrise to sunset. His father forced him to drop out of school in the fifth grade so that he could help his family in the field. My father still gets tears in his eyes when he tells me the story of how his teacher came to his house one day and begged his family to let him continue with his education, that he showed great potential. My grandfather responded to her with, he's going to work his ass off in life just like I did. He doesn't need school. At age 17, he moved to Venezuela where he made a living in construction and sent every single dime he could spare back home to Italy to help support his family. He's 78 now and still works in construction and refuses to retire so that he can continue to make a better life for his wife and three daughters. My mother was born a couple years after the end of World War II into an extremely poor family. She tells stories about how her mother would go clean homes of rich people and feed steaks to her employer's dogs only to go home and scoop up the dirty remnants of food that would wash down the gutters of their neighborhood and serve it to her family for dinner. There were nights that they would gnaw on their fingers because just the act of chewing helped soothe their empty stomach. Her dad was in prison for most of her childhood, so her brother had to be the man of her home. Her sister ran away to England to, due to the embarrassment and shame for allowing herself to be molested by her own father. And the entirety of her life as a hermit. My mom dropped out of the fifth grade as well because she didn't know what she would do with an education. That was for boys and rich girls anyways. My mother grew up with an intense fear of having her reputation marred. Living in a small Italian vi village in the 50s with a family like hers made it very hard to develop any kind of confidence. She swore to herself that whatever happened, that someday 
She would raise a family she could be proud of and talk about to her friends with her head held high. I knew these stories. They were told to me time and time again while my mom was making dinner and crying because she felt so lucky to have food on the table. My dad would wake up with a screaming fit while he slept on the couch and would tell us that it was another nightmare of a bomb falling on him. I heard these stories. They never affected me the way they do now. <laughs> After having this time and space to reflect on the effects of my upbringing, I was able to realize that just as my past had affected me, their past had affected them. I had the luxury of living in a excuse me, time and place where people can get help with dealing with their past. I have the luxury of having a college education and people in my life who help me come to terms with my experiences and help me make the most of them. My parents didn't have that luxury. All they had in their toolbox was a, was a fifth grade education and unrelenting resilience and hope that someday things would be better for them and their family. I'm at the point in my life where I can finally say I'm no longer angry. I can look at my parents and see them as products of their environment and experiences. Instead of being afraid of my father, I now look at him with admiration that he was able to withstand all that he went through and was able to provide a comfortable living for his family. His greatest pride and joy in life is to say that he was able to send his daughters to college and that two of the three of them have earned their doctorates in their respective fields. I look at my mother and I'm astounded that she was able to leave her entire family, jump on a plane by herself for the first time, and come to America to live with the man she met and married long way after a month of dating. She couldn't speak English, couldn't drive a car, and didn't know a single soul. Nine months later, during her first Michigan winter, she had her first child and has been tough as nails ever since. I look at my parents now and see two people who sacrificed everything they had and did everything they knew how to do to give their children a better life. And somehow they did that, even if it wasn't the way I would have chosen, given the choice. In a weird way, I'm almost thankful for my experiences as they brought me to this understanding. Just the way my parents deserve my empathy, so does everyone else around me. What did the homeless person on the corner have to deal with as a child? What kind of horrible things had to happen to a person to shape them into a criminal behind bars? Everyone knows their story, and hopefully somewhere in that story is the part where someone or something came along to help them beat the odds. For those that aren't so lucky, that's where we come in. We have the power to be that for those around us through empathy, caring, and love. Whether it's the criminal behind bars, the homeless man or woman on the corner, or that family member that just can't seem to shake their past. Thank you. Thank you. So we've come to that point in the program for the MC address. My name is Steven Soden. I'm your MC for the day. Um, I'm proud to say this is uh, been the let's put this one here then. Sorry. <laughs> I've been the uh, I've been the uh, MC for 10 assemblies now, and I, I, I just so pleased uh, to each of you at our events and here at the assemblies. It's just been, it's just, Sunday assembly has been an amazing, enriching part of my life and my wife's life. Um, it keeps us very busy, but uh, we really, uh, really enjoy it. I'd like 
tell you a couple of things about myself. A few things, I guess. Um, when I was five years old, I was playing in, uh, I was playing uh, baseball in the front yard with some of my neighbor kids, and uh, I was playing catcher, and uh, the batter had a wooden bat, and he went back to hit the uh, ball and hit me in the mouth. I went to the hospital, I got two stitches in my lip, and uh, from that day to this, I've had a fat lip, which was very pronounced when I was young, and you know, I was very self-conscious of it growing up. When I was uh, eight years old in Santa Rosa, California, I was playing with my neighbor friend Randy in between the two houses. We found a cigarette, and we were trying to smoke it. Um, and my dad caught us, and he, uh, he sent me into the house. He went to the grocery store. He came back with a pack of camera bomb filter cigarettes. He uh, opened the garage door, sat down in a chair with a cigarette, and had me smoking in front of the entire neighborhood. I was smoking, crying, and getting sicker and sicker, and when my dad felt like I had enough, he said, I'm going to put these cigarettes on the shelf where you can read some. If you ever want to have another cigarette, go ahead and have it yourself. And I never smoked again after that. <laughs> when I was in fourth grade, I was a really good kid. I was elected uh, ASB representative from my class. Uh, so we were, I went after coming back from the uh, discussing the burning issues of the elementary school, I came back to report back to my class. Um, and I, uh, I really had to go to the bathroom very badly, but I didn't stop because I didn't have a pass to go, and I'm a really good kid. so. I, I went back to my class, and I'm standing in front of the class, and I'm walking back and forth trying to hold my bladder, and I ended up peeing in front of my whole fourth grade class, uh, which was very embarrassing and affected me for a long time after that. I never told that story even to anybody except for my wife uh, a couple of days ago, so the only people who know about that, except for everybody in the fourth grade class. And only, <laughs> only two of them left, and it's scratching the wrong <laughs> In, in 1969, I remember very well, one summer day, I was uh, playing out in the backyard with my brothers and sisters. All four of us were playing out in the backyard. A beautiful day. It was June 21st. And my mother made us come in and sit down and watch television right in the middle of the day. And I watched for the first time in the history of, of humankind a person step on the surface of the moon. And it was, it was on live television. It was just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, even to this day. I just want to say I get emotional about it. But, it was, it was amazing, it, was, um, it, it changed my interest from that day on in what was possible. And it also decided for us once and for all whether um, the moon was actually made of cheese because kids could actually thought that it might be, and I'm not kidding about that, that's what we actually thought. Um, when I was, uh, when I was uh, in high school, my friend Jeff and I used to cut through the Sears um, uh, on the way home from school because there was a, there was a magic shop at the Sears and um, uh, one day when we were passing through, there was this thing on the television. It was this game. It was developed by Atari. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's called Pong. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Check it out. It's mind-blowing. You'll, so you'll never see it behind it. When I was uh, 16, I got my uh, driver's license on my birthday. And that evening, I started my first job delivering pizzas for Vinny's Pizzeria. And uh, a couple months later, I had my first drink of liquor from Vinny's Pizzeria. <laughs> when I was uh, 18, I, uh, my, my friend Tony and I, we just graduated high school and we'd been reading Fair Little Thing in Las Vegas. We took a uh, bag of illicit substances, it was the 70s after all, and uh, we traveled 3,000 miles, a uh, three week trip up the coast of California through San Francisco up to Vancouver and back down in a Fiat uh, Spider convertible with one audio cassette tape, uh, less two decks. Ghost Town Parade, which I probably will never listen to again the rest of my life. But I really grew up a lot during that uh, period of time, that three weeks, I, it was uh, during that trip, I guess is the way to say it. Um, <laughs> these things and thousands of other things that have happened in my life have shaped the person that I am, and it's the same for each of you. I, I couldn't say it any better than, than Stephanie's story, uh, what Stacy's told us about her best friend, and, and, and Amy's reading. Our, our theme today is to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Other people's shoes. That means walk around in their shoes. Look at the world through their eyes. See, see things as they see them. And we can't, really, because we're not those people. I mean, everybody has a story, and it's not just the things that happen to us. It's how the things that happen to us affected us. I mean, what we learned from them, or what we didn't learn. How we dealt with the things that happened to us. And that makes us the people that we are, so there's work to do if we, if we want to be the kind of people that are going to be empathetic, because empathy is one of the highest human emotions. To be empathetic for other people, we have to do work. It means we have to do work. We have to try to put ourselves in their place. 
we don't know what anybody's gone through. So whatever their experiences are, the same set of experiences for one person may be a totally different thing for another person. It'd be easy for me to see somebody that's homeless and say, well, if it was me, I'd get a job and I'd, I'd, I'd take a shower. I'm not that person. I don't know what they've been through. I mean, we've heard stories today. We, we don't know. But we, we have the golden rule. We all know it. Do to others as we would have them do to you. And I've always lived by that. I, I think it's a great rule, but uh, somebody brought up to me the other day uh, the platinum rule, which is a variation of the golden rule, which is do unto others as they would have done to them. Do for people what you think they need, not what you need. And that takes work. And that's what we assemblers can do. Thank you. And uh, um, in the assembly, oh dear, sorry, my life happens at one moment, sorry. I said you're very important events in the corner there. So um, we ask you uh, before the assembly, please come in and uh, just put on a card some of the things that happened to you in the last month. We'd like to share them with the entire assembly. Uh, certainly, if uh, um, we do, we can remain anonymous if that's something you'd like to do. Um, uh, for one assembler, my cousin died on Friday from cancer. So does his sister, Chris, uh, less than 44 So did his sister less than 24 hours later. Um, just wanted to acknowledge him uh, publicly and say that I love them and will miss them. Thank you for being here today. Marley got 100% on our biology test three weeks in a row. Yes, Marley! <laughs> Shirley Chung, where are you? Shirley Chung, you say it. I retired. Yes!
haven't seen Aiden Harris come, you see I won't say more. He's an atheist comedian. Uh, he is hilarious. He's been on Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel and he's uh, he's uh, the host of a comedy tour, and he, he has a great set that you should all come out for. It's $22. The tickets for uh, this event, the trivia, and the uh, uh, Ian Harris are in the back. Ian Harris is $22. Um, a lot of that goes to um, Sunday Assembly as a fundraiser. A funny razor, excuse me, but that's 9.30 p.m. Um, uh, 5.15, 5.15, what is it, Saturday night, we get from Friday night, May 15th, thank you, Bob. Hello, all my friends. Um, at 5.16, the Sunworth Youth Housing Project, that is a painting detail. Chloe, can you tell us about that one? So, yeah. <laughs> Brewery downtown, three dollar beer night. Uh, that's just a get together and hang out. Well, we've done a few of those, and it's been great. Um, family dinner uh, this time, so it's the day before the assembly. Next assembly is five twenty-four. It's uh, Sunday, of course, at eleven a.m. Right here at your uh, women's club at Third and Maple. Family dinner is Akias no. Texcoco. No, that's a lie. I've not been there. Okay, don't even pay attention to that. And don't pay attention to that. Um, a couple of things in Sunday Assembly world, we have um, calendars in the back. If you want to just uh, check out the dates, you put that on the refrigerator, you know what Sunday Assembly is. We have our new newsletter, uh, so that we have the copies of that in the back, and that will be posted on the website later today. Um, uh, there is a conference for Sunday Assembly. Uh, it is taking place in Atlanta, 5, uh, 20, uh, May 28th through the 31st. That is an international conference. It's the second international conference for Sunday Assembly. Very, very excited about that. We also have the Ian Harris uh, uh, fighters there. And uh, as I mentioned, Sunday Assembly is not for profit. We really uh, rely on your donations, particularly recurring donations. If, you're, uh, if you would need to do that, we'd appreciate it in any amount. Um, we have a PayPal store, card readers in the back, we take check, cash, anything we can do. The recurring donations help us to budget and plan. We have our budget in the back, our 501c3. Um, we want to make sure we're completely transparent, where all the money is allocated. Uh, we're barely solid, so we could really appreciate your help with that. Uh, we uh, uh, have been funded mostly by volunteers up to this point, and, uh, and uh, you nice people who have pitched in, so thank you very much for that. Um, we have swag in the back. We have shirts in larger sizes, so if you tried to buy a shirt before, we have the shirts in, uh, and I say larger sizes, not because you need larger sizes, but because the sizing on the shirts was very small. Uh, so uh, I myself am wearing two sizes up from what I normally wear, so there you go, the kind of a, a thumbnail to go by. And we have, for the first time in the history of Sunday Assembly San Diego, these extremely nice, uh, high-quality tote bags um, that when you go to the store and they ask you what it is, assuming that it's something else, you'll uh, blow their minds when you explain exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, I say that because when we went to the Earth Fair last year, we were in between, I hope I don't get in trouble saying this, I'm sorry, we were between two atheist groups there. We had people that kept coming at, uh, up to us asking, how do you feel being between these two atheist groups here? <laughs> well, actually, that's <laughs> okay. Um, let's see if I forgot 
basically, except for one more song, and that is, this is a great song, I love this song, we're going to sing the song by the Proclaimers, um, this will be on video, please, this is a single one, get up and sing, after that, of course, tea, coffee, and snacks, um, we are going to meet up after the assembly, uh, at Pizza Cotto, right after the assembly, yes, sir. Saturday, so I know none of you are busy during that period of time, so no excuse to go this busy event. Thank you very much for sharing that. really appreciate it. That's very awesome. Okay, let's go. Uh, we are the Proclaimers, 500 miles. Up on your feet if you care to.